Good morning. You're all very welcome to our service of worship this morning. I've got four upcoming events to highlight and notice regarding the election of our church committee, a devotional resource from PCI uh, to draw to your attention, um, and a thank you to offer. So first of all, next Sunday, the 25th of September, uh, Messy Church Fun Day. It was postponed uh, from last week. It's now set for next Sunday from 3 o'clock uh, to 5 o'clock. Please spread the word. Please come yourself and bring family and friends with you. And please pray for the Messy Church team and for all who will come along next Sunday afternoon. As a consequence of that shift to next Sunday for the Messy Church Fun Day, our monthly afternoon service will now be held on Sunday, the 2nd of October at 3 o'clock in Kirkara. Then this incoming week on Tuesday evening and again on Thursday morning, our small groups resume. We're going to be using the Expressions, a PCI resource, to help us explore how faith can be expressed in our everyday lives. You've had notice of that through the emails, but if you're interested in signing up, then speak to me this morning. And then um, tomorrow week, Monday the 26th, in the evening we have our defibrillator awareness session, half past seven. It's open to everybody and it's free. Again, if you'd like uh, to attend, you can sign up through the emails that have been going out or speak to me this morning. With regard to the election of a new church committee, um, last Sunday and again this Sunday the voters list has been published and displayed in the church vestibule. Uh, next Sunday, the 25th of September, and again on the 2nd of October, nomination papers will be available in the vestibule and should be returned by Sunday, the 9th of October. And as you consider uh, nominating uh, people to serve on the committee, there's a little leaflet produced by PCI called Choosing a New Congregational Committee. It's available in the vestibule and has been attached to the What's Happening email uh, that was sent out on Friday. As part of PCI's uh, response and resourcing of congregations at this time of reflection after the death of uh, Her Late Majesty um, Queen Elizabeth II, there is a devotional uh, called In This Moment. Again, uh, that has been issued by email on Thursday, but if you're not in receipt of email, then there are paper copies of this devotional available in the vestibule uh, for you this morning. Please pick one up before you leave. And then finally, just to thank you for your generosity regarding the storehouse van appeal. To date, we've raised four and a half thousand pounds, and today's the final day of contributions. But we want to thank you so much for your wonderful support. And I'll be visiting with Storehouse this week uh, and talking to them a little bit more about their plans uh, and their challenges ahead, and I'll report back to you in due course. As we come together to worship today, let me remind you what Jesus said. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. This morning we gather, as many others do, with a sense of sadness and yet gratitude for the life, service, and witness of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Each year Her Majesty spent her summers in Balmoral and faithfully attended the local Presbyterian Church. She enjoyed the simplicity of the worship and the centrality of God's Word. This morning, as we engage in the simplicity of worship with God's Word at the center, we pray for God's Spirit to lead and guide our worship. I invite you now to join me as we bow our heads before God and come together in prayer. Lord God, we praise you for your love revealed in Jesus Christ. 
We thank you that your love is greater than we can ever imagine and stronger than death itself. So we know that we can trust you with our loved ones and with ourselves. Though we enter this place with sorrow in our hearts, we lift up our hearts in gratitude for all your blessings to us. Though we come as people burdened by fear and guilt, we rejoice in the forgiveness you always offer to us. Though we walk amidst the shadows of death, we celebrate your promise of new life. Though our hearts are filled with grief, we do not grieve as those without hope. In these days of national mourning, we recall with gratitude our late Queen, your servant Elizabeth, and the gifts which you gave to her, and all the ways in which you sustained her throughout her long life and reign. Hear our thanks for this nation of ours, for its people and its places, the human tapestry of young and old, women and men, the city dweller and the country folk, our many creeds and customs, our diverse places and histories, yet bound together on this day as one people. May the God of the open heart and the Christ of the gentle joy and the spirit of the embracing love grant to each one of us in this place of gathering the grace that enhances each life and community. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Let's stand to sing as we use the words of our opening praise. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven.
written about the Queen over the last 10 days, and much comment and opinion has been shared. Personally, I have found the words of Her Majesty the Queen, her own words, often delivered as part of her annual Christmas messages, much more significant and a much finer tribute than anything offered in our press and media. The following short video is a compilation of statements made by the late Queen, revealing her faith in Jesus and her reliance on God throughout her long reign as monarch. Simple happenings that form the starting point of the life of Jesus, a man whose teachings have been handed down from generation to generation and have been the bedrock of my faith. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. But I shall not have strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join in it with me, as I now invite you to do. I know that your support will be unfailingly given. God help me to make good my vow, and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. And there comes the presentation to her of the Bible upon which she took her oath. Our gracious Queen, to keep your majesty ever mindful of the law and the gospel of God as the rule for the whole life and government of Christian princes, we present you with this book, the most valuable thing with the world afford. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. I hope that like me you will be comforted by the example of Jesus of Nazareth, who often in circumstances of great adversity managed to live an outgoing, unselfish and sacrificial life. He makes it clear that genuine human happiness and satisfaction lie more in giving than receiving, more in serving than in being served. We can surely be grateful that 2,000 years after the birth of Jesus, so many of us are able to draw inspiration from his life and message and to find in him a source of strength and courage. Jesus Christ lived obscurely for most of his life and never traveled far. He was maligned and rejected by many, though he had done no wrong. In his early 30s, he was arrested, tortured, and crucified with two criminals. His death might have been the end of the story, but then came the resurrection, and with it, the foundation of the Christian faith. Although we are capable of great acts of kindness, history teaches us that we sometimes need saving from ourselves from our recklessness or our greed. God sent into the world a unique person, neither a philosopher nor a general, important though they are, but a savior with the power to forgive. We're going to allow Jam to leave us at this point. We'll catch up with you guys a little bit later during coffee.
Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Eternal God, you rule over the past, the present, and the future. Receive our thanks this day for the heritage of faith, the words of Scripture, and the hymns of the church. In times of sudden change and alteration, when we miss the familiar and long for stability, reassure us of the constancy of your love. Hear our thanks for Elizabeth, our Queen, now departed from us, but blessed by grace, resolute in service, and modest in person through all her days. We lift up our hearts in gratitude for the years of her reign and the sweep of history through which she provided both anchor and steer. We thank you for her dedication to this nation and to the commonwealth, and for all the rich gifts of wisdom, kindness, and inclusion she brought to her long decades of service. We bless you for the myriad lives she touched, and for that radiant presence that reached out to others, bringing comfort in hard times, celebrating achievement and high endeavor, honoring courage and sacrificial service. We thank you for her cheerfulness and commitment, for the steadfast faith that sustained her all her days, and for the determination of her life in the cause of duty. King of kings and Lord of lords, we thank you for the families she united through her person, those near and dear to her in her own home life, those brought together across this kingdom, and those spread throughout the commonwealth of nations so close to her heart. For the Queen's family most nearly touched by her loss, we seek your blessing and support in these days of mourning. The Princess Royal, the Duke of York, the Duke of Wessex, the Duke of Cambridge, the Duke of Sussex, and all their families. Bless Charles, our King, and the Queen Consort. Support our King in these days of preparation. Imbue Him with strength of character, openness of heart, keenness of mind, and a generosity of spirit that will sustain Him in the time to come through Jesus Christ our Lord. And for our nation at this time, we pray, seeking comfort in our loss and hopefulness as we step forward into the days ahead. As our gratitude mingles with sadness, may we support each other and together be communities of tenderness and kindness. Sustain us with the strong memories of the past. Strengthen us with the hope for generations yet unborn. And renew us for service in our own days of living. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tears and Celebration is a new hymn for the UK and Commonwealth. It is a song of remembrance, assurance, and thanksgiving, giving voice to the hearts and minds of people all over the world following the death of Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Released by the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity and the Bible Society, It features world-renowned mezzo-soprano Catherine Jenkins and was written by Andy Flanagan with Sarm Hargreaves to the well-known tune, Here is Love Vast as the Ocean. The lyrics offer words to help people give thanks for the Queen's life and faith, speak of her powerful example of discipleship, and pray each of us will be able to make a difference through Christ in the same way. Together they make up a powerful song, that helps us mourn and invites us to participate in God's work in all of life, as Elizabeth did. We see tears and celebration for this life so dignified 
bearing thanks and hearts of sadness to the God of death and life as he takes her to his promise of an audience with the king we remember all she gave us wreaths of
we mourn the loss of Queen Elizabeth II. We thank God for her faith and her life, defined by service and commitment to her God and country. The longest reigning monarch, the Queen was well respected around the world and an inspiration to many Christians as she lived out her faith as a leader in the public square. Perhaps the first known outward sign of the Queen's deeply held faith was when she was 13 years old. The young Elizabeth handed a Christian poem to her father, which read, Go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than light and safer than a known way. The king went on to quote this poem in his 1939 Christmas speech to encourage Britons facing the challenges of a second war. Elizabeth dedicated her life to her people and asked for prayer eight years later on her 21st birthday. And at her coronation in 1953, when she promised to govern her country, the young queen prayed, God help me to make good my vow, and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. In front of the 20 million people watching the ceremony, she also promised to uphold justice and mercy and maintain the laws of God and the true profession of the gospel. The Queen's annual Christmas broadcasts were watched by millions, and she openly shared her faith using this platform. In 2012, she talked about the God who sent His Son to serve, not to be served, and in doing so, restored love and service to the center of our lives in the person of Jesus Christ. I invite you now to turn with me to that passage that the Queen referenced in her 2012 Christmas address. It's Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. Let's listen to the Word of God. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give His life a ransom for many." The context of this exchange between James and John and Jesus and the reaction of the disciples, well, it's important for us to grasp that. It helps us understand what's happening. Jesus and His disciples were on their way to Jerusalem. In verses 33 and 34, Jesus explains to His disciples what is about to happen. We're going up to Jerusalem, He said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn Him to death and will hand Him over to the Gentiles, who will mock Him and spit on Him, flog Him and kill Him. Three days later, He will rise. 
Mark offers this comment on the journey to Jerusalem in verse 32. The disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. And what follows in verses 35 to 45, we've just read together, reveals the tensions and struggles within the group of chosen associates we know as the disciples or the apostles. While they had spent three years following Jesus, watching, learning, engaging, experiencing firsthand the miraculous and transformative ministry of Jesus, they were still struggling to process all that they had been privy to. And they still had some way to go in terms of understanding the ministry and mission of Jesus and how that would reshape their worldview, their understanding of faith, and their following of Jesus. Reading Mark's account of this conversation between Jesus and the two sons of Zebedee, I'm always struck by the audacity, the boldness, the directness of these two men. We want you to do for us whatever we ask. I recently encountered the term hyper-individualism. It refers to the tendency to act with only self in mind and without regards to others. The term itself, hyper-individualism, is relatively new, coined in the last decade. But it seeks to describe something that is as old as time. The somewhat impertinent request made by James and John is a perfect example of hyper-individualism. And we would do well to pause and to reflect on the attitude that we see so starkly presented in this request and ask ourselves this question, are we just as self-orientated as these two disciples were? Throughout the Queen's reign, one consistent theme was that of service towards others. This was not only evident in the 15,000-plus engagements she fulfilled and the over 600 charities she supported as patron, but in the messages that she broadcast each Christmas. In 2008, she said, I hope that like me, you will be comforted by the example of Jesus of Nazareth, who, often in circumstances of great adversity, managed to live an outgoing, unselfish, and sacrificial life. Countless millions of people around the world continue to celebrate His birthday at Christmas, inspired by His teaching. He makes it clear that genuine human happiness and satisfaction lie more in giving than receiving, more in serving than being served. As Jesus then responds to the brother's request, He looks to help these two disciples understand what following Him and sharing in His mission entails. Here's what He says, verse 38, "'Can you drink the cup I drink, or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with?' What Jesus was referencing here was the cost and the commitment that following Him would involve. At no point in Jesus' teaching or ministry did He ever seek to downplay the cost of being a disciple. There is no evidence of Jesus trying to make faith an easy option, or a pain-free option, or simply just a matter of receiving. Time and time again, Jesus talked about service, as He does here in verse 45. Describing His own ministry and mission, Jesus says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. There is a fundamental principle that sits behind this iconic statement. Jesus never asked anyone to do something he was not prepared to do himself. Jesus never asked anyone to do something he was not prepared 
to do himself. Jesus was the exemplary leader. Matthew records these words of Jesus in chapter 16 of his gospel account. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus understood the purpose and mission of his life. It flowed from his relationship with God. His whole ministry was shaped by that relationship. And throughout the gospel accounts, we find Jesus absenting himself from the crowds, even from the disciples, to spend time with his Father in prayer. And we noted recently in our studies in Philippians that the one aspect of Jesus' ministry that the disciples explicitly asked Jesus to teach them was to pray. As I have read the quotes and the excerpts from many of the Queen's Christmas addresses, I've discovered that time and time again she speaks of prayer. It has been well documented by many who had the privilege of knowing her that prayer was integral to her daily life and something that she gave her full attention to. We, I think, can be guilty of considering service only in terms of visible actions. In reality, service begins not with action, but with attitude. An attitude is shaped by authority. In other words, we take our lead from the authority we submit to. For some, that is a set of historic values and customs. For others, it's in terms of an institution or religion. And for some, it is self. Her Majesty the Queen acknowledged her reliance on God. He was her authority. And on her 90th birthday, she wrote a foreword to a book that was entitled The Servant Queen and the King She Serves, in which she says of God, I have seen His faithfulness. As the conversation unfolds between Jesus and the brothers, the remaining disciples react. Mark tells us they became indignant. And so Jesus calls them all together, spells out the path He is on and the reason He must walk this path. And in verse 45, we have the climax to that explanation. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give His life a ransom for many. We sometimes hear that verse, and, and we miss the adverb right at the beginning, even. For even the Son of Man, for even Jesus didn't come to be served, emphasizing His place, His attitude, His approach. He didn't come to lord it over people. Instead, in a remarkable and unprecedented act, Jesus has come as the servant king. In doing so, Jesus has set the pattern for all who would follow Him. This is now the pattern for us. It is a pattern that challenges our desire for status and recognition, for power and control. We see in the brothers' request an attempt to steal a march on their fellow disciples and to do, secure for themselves places of honor and prestige and influence. Jesus' words and actions put paid to such ideas, and instead, invites us to assume a servant-hearted posture. And as the Queen rightly observed, Jesus makes it clear that a God-honoring life is more in giving than receiving, more in serving than being served. One of the evident consequences of the pandemic in terms of church life and the mission of the church is the radical reduction 
in the number of volunteers to serve in ministry roles, and most vitally, to engage in mission. That is, reaching out beyond our membership to the community and city of which we are part. We can bemoan the smaller attendances at gathered worship and the reduction in groups and activities in our church life. We can analyze the problem. We can point the finger. But let me ask you this. Have you ever stopped to think and ask yourself this question, what could I do? In 2016, the Queen observed, Jesus Christ lived obscurely for most of His life, never traveled far. He was maligned and rejected by many, though He had done no wrong. Yet billions of people now follow His teaching and find in Him the guiding light for their lives. I am one of them because Christ's example helps me see the value of doing small things with great love. Doing small things with great love. I invite you today to consider what small things you might do with great love that would serve the ministry and particularly the mission that we're called to as a church fellowship in this city at this time. Jesus' service ultimately led to His sacrifice, giving His life a ransom for many. And the meal that we will shortly share together reminds us of that sacrifice, but it also points towards the hope held out in the gospel, the living hope and the inheritance we have in Christ. The Greek word translated ransom is lutron, a noun meaning price paid to free a slave, or liberty price. There are two sides to this word. There's the freeing from and the freeing to. Jesus' death on the cross, His sacrifice, put paid to the penalty for sin, which is death. And His resurrection declared that freedom is ours through faith in Him. In John's Gospel, we read these words of Jesus. If you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. In 2011, the Queen included this in her Christmas message. Although we are capable of great acts of kindness, history teaches us that we are sometimes in need of saving from ourselves, from our recklessness or our greed. God sent into the world a unique person, neither a philosopher nor a general, important though they are, but a Savior with the power to forgive. You may have never met the Queen, but today in this place, you can meet the Savior. You may have been inspired by the Queen's life, and today you can be forgiven by the Savior. You may mourn the passing of the Queen and the loss of her steadfastness and faithfulness as sovereign, but in this place you can know the freedom and hope-filled future that is yours through faith and trust in the One who came to serve and to give His life a ransom for you. We're going to stand now, and we're going to sing together the words of Psalm 23. All of the hymns that have been chosen today are all favorites of Her Majesty the Queen. And as we stand to sing this much-loved psalm, we use it as our prayer and preparation as we come around the table spread before us in the presence of our enemies. 
anointed with oil, and the cup overflowing. And stand and worship God. Please take your seats. Let us hear again the institution of the Lord's Supper as Paul records it in his letter to the Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in His name I invite all those who know and love the Lord to come and share in all that He has provided for us. We follow Jesus' example and command, who on the night He was betrayed took bread and gave thanks. Let us bow our heads together as we give thanks to God now. 
Let us pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we bless and thank you today for your great generosity and goodness towards us, and supremely your generosity and grace displayed in Jesus Christ, your Son. We thank you for his willingness to leave aside the majesty of heaven and to step into this murky, broken, sin-infested world of ours. and to follow the path that would ultimately lead to the cross, there to give Himself in our place, on our behalf. That in His death, the price of our sin is paid in full. And in His resurrection, our forgiveness is declared, our freedom is declared, our new hope and life eternal is declared. We come around this table grateful and thankful for all that it represents in terms of what Jesus has done, and in terms of what Jesus is doing within us, and in terms of what Jesus will one day do when He draws us together with all of His people into His kingdom. We set aside now this bread and wine from all its normal uses to this holy and special use, praying that as we share of the bread and of the cup, so our faith will be strengthened and deepened, so our hearts will be realigned to focus on You and to follow as You would lead us, and that in all of our lives, be they long or short, that we would give ourselves in service to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Meet with us now around this table, we pray. For this we ask in our Savior's name. Amen. And having given thanks, he took the bread and broke it, saying, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the similar manner, after supper, he took the cup and declared, This is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Drink from it, all of you, in remembrance of me. As the elements are distributed, I would ask you to pause until everyone has received. We will then take the bread and then subsequently the wine together, symbolizing our unity in Christ, the one bread and the one cup. For those who have a gluten intolerance, uh, there are little receptacles uh, that you can avail of as the servers make their way around to you. Let's receive what God in His grace has given us in Jesus Christ.
Take, eat, the body of Christ broken for us. This cup is the new covenant sealed in Christ's blood. Drink from it, all of you, in remembrance of him. Now join with me, please, as we say together the words of the prayer Jesus has taught us to pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we come to the close of our service, we're going to sing one final hymn together. And as I say, all the hymns today have been chosen because they are favorites of Her Late Majesty. 
After the final hymn, I'd ask you to remain standing for a short prayer and a blessing, and then the national anthem. We'll sing both verses of the anthem, and the words will be on the screen. Tea and coffee will be served immediately after the service. Let us stand then as we sing together, I vow to thee, my country. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, bless our sovereign Lord King Charles and all who are in authority under him, that they may order all things in wisdom and equity, righteousness and peace, to the honor of your name and the good of your church and people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God in his infinite love and mercy. Bring the whole church living and departed to a joyful resurrection and the fulfillment of His eternal kingdom and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. The National Anthem. <laughs>